All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm going to switch over here to Adrian, who's going to kick things off for us today. Thanks for joining us to uh, learn a little bit more about uh, best practices and ultrasound assisted lubrication and uh, to hear about our newest ultra probe. So Adrian, we'll let you uh, get things started here. Um, just so everybody knows, we are going to record this. So if you um, have to drop off early or you've got a coworker that just couldn't make it, um, not to worry. We'll put this up on our website in um, just a day or two. And uh, also, if you have questions throughout, just type those into the questions box, and I will uh, get those to Adrian, and we'll uh, we'll kind of try and make this as interactive as we can. Uh, and uh, with that, Adrian, we'll let you go ahead and kick things off. Okay, perfect. Well, again, good afternoon, and we appreciate your time today. Uh, we're going to where uh, it's really become a big application for ultrasound, and that's on condition-based lubrication. Uh, it's probably uh, one of the easier applications in which you can implement ultrasound, and it's a, an application where you can show some tremendous uh, cost reductions that we'll talk about as in regards to uh, lubricant and, uh, and grease usage, as well as you know, man time or man hours spent out in the plant and the facility uh, lubricating equipment. And uh, hopefully um, everyone will, will have some uh, great takeaways from today. And uh, as Maureen mentioned, we will be recording this. Uh, so we'll, we'll archive that on our website as well. So before we uh, jump right into the latest uh, UltraProbe model, the UltraProbe 401 uh, Digital Grease Caddy, in which we actually uh, unveiled that for the first time at the SMRP annual conference down in Orlando just a few weeks ago. I uh, wanted to just kind of uh, kind of lead into um, talking about lubrication in general and, and kind of where ultrasound fits into your lubrication program. Uh, first of all, I think most of you are familiar with the UltraPro 201 Grease Caddy. Uh, it's been out uh, since approximately June 2004. Uh, it's a simple analog instrument that's used basically for the prevention of over and under lubrication of rotating equipment. The readout is just a simple vertical LED bar graph that represents the decibel level. There is no uh, data storage, uh, but it is very simple and easy to use. Uh, certainly much, um, much more effective than just going out with just a regular uh, grease gun and not listening uh, to the bearing while you're greasing. And then uh, again in October of this year, we released with time-based lubrication, as most of you know, is you know, what if the bearing that is being greased already has enough grease and doesn't need to be lubricated? Uh, so the inherent risk of time-based lube procedures or time-based lube PMs is to over-lubricate. Uh, we also see um, you know, plants and facilities who have a, a large number of lubrication or over-lubrication related failures you know, they choose to take the extreme and say, okay, we're just going to cut out greasing our motors, uh, which again, that produces the risk of, of under-lubricated uh, bearings. So another issue, again, for the interval is, is it correct? Uh, you know, what if bearings need to be lubricated more often uh, due to runtime or operating conditions? Or, you know, if the, if the incorrect grease is being used, it may break down a lot faster. So uh, again, you know, we're, we're thinking about time-based lubrication, uh, the amount of grease that we're applying, is it, is it correct? And then the frequency, how often we're greasing that piece of equipment, is it correct? And then we can take this and put it into uh, our P to F curve. Uh, and there really is a, another uh, aspect of this P to F curve. Uh, you may have heard of it. It's called the I to P to F. Uh, but really when it comes to condition-based lubrication, we're trying to extend that I to P interval. So we're really, you know, once that piece of equipment is installed, uh, once it's started up, we really want to make sure that we are uh, effectively greasing those bearings. Again, if we start to over-lubricate those bearings, it's going to cause friction. It's going to cause that premature bearing failure, uh, early stage bearing failure uh, problems. So again, uh, you know, once we're at P1, once we've uh, detected a failure, um, you know, now we're going to have to take some sort of action. 
so we'll talk today about how we can use ultrasound to obviously identify uh, that point uh, P1, uh, you know, trying to detect that problem at its earliest instance. But then again, over here uh, in our I to P area, again, we're trying to optimize that bearing life. And really the best way to do that is through condition-based lubrication. Again, if we go out with just a grease gun and apply grease, if we're not listening to the bearing, uh, if we're not monitoring the decibel level, then we really don't know if we're over or under greasing that bearing. Or if the bearing is bad, you know, we're not going to be able to hear it because, you know, obviously we're not listening to it with our ultrasonic instruments. So again, using ultrasound to optimize bearing life can be done in this I to P interval, and that's through condition-based lubrication. So what is ultrasound-assisted lubrication, as we like to call it? Um, basically, adding ultrasound monitoring to standard lubrication best practices can help to prevent potential over-lubrication uh, of bearings as well as under-lubricated bearings. Uh, you're going to find more problems uh, than, again, just going out with just a, a grease gun. So we're going to be listening to bearing itself as we're applying grease. And that's going to help to extend the motor and bearing life as well and lead to a decreased amount of lubricant use. Uh, we've had uh, customers, you know, users of the equipment who are using ultrasound for condition-based lubrication have, you know, documented savings, uh, you know, tremendous savings, uh, basically in a reduction of the amount of grease that they're using, a reduction in the amount of uh, man hours spent greasing equipment, and then, uh, you know, motor rebuild and, you know, bearing costs uh, can be dramatically reduced, again, because the inherent risk of time-based lubrication is to either over-lubricate or under-lubricate the bearing. So we'll have improved asset availability and reliability in the facility in general. And uh, again, it's a, it's a great, easy-to-use application for ultrasound. You can have some uh, really big uh, findings. So when it comes to the source of the ultrasound, uh, you may be familiar with using airborne or an ultrasound to find air leaks. Uh, the source of the ultrasound there is turbulence, where you have something under high pressure trying to exit out to low pressure or atmosphere, and that creates turbulence. Uh, with mechanical inspection in regards to uh, lubrication, the source of the ultrasound is friction. So when we have a bearing that needs to be lubricated, we have an increase in friction and therefore an increase in the decibel level. Hopefully as we apply grease to that bearing, as we watch the associated decibel level, uh, if the bearing needed grease, we're going to see a gradual decrease or a drop in the decibel level. Uh, there's lubricant entering the bearing housing, therefore there's less friction, therefore less noise. Uh, and I have some sound files uh, that I'll play for you towards the end of what that would sound like so you can actually see uh, in the Spectralizer software uh, the before and then the after. So trending the associated decibel levels and then changes in the sound quality of the bearing is going to provide an early indication of conditions. Uh, again, and uh, what happens if the bearing is already over lubricated, as you gradually apply grease, then you'll see the reverse happen. So we're increasing both pressure and friction inside the housing as we over lubricate and therefore an increase in the decibel level. So related to ultrasound, uh, basically the instruments are just simply listening devices. We're listening for high frequency sound above the range of normal human hearing. Uh, normal human hearing on the average, uh, the threshold uh, is around 16 to 17 kilohertz. So the ultrasonic rate range begins at 20 kilohertz. So the instruments are already tuned to receive signals or sound waves that are above what we're capable of hearing. Uh, again, it makes it very ideal because most of your plants and facilities and environments are just typically loud uh, due to, you know, motors running in the background, uh, you know, compressors, you know, all these things in the plant that make noise uh, that we can hear in the audible range, but the ultrasonic uh, instrument can't hear. So there's three general uh, divisions of ultrasound. Uh, the, ultra, the form of ultrasound that we typically think of right off the, the bat is the pulse echo form of ultrasound. Uh, more commonly in the maintenance and reliability field, that would be like a thickness gauge uh, to where we're emitting a pulse. It's echoed back and uh, you know, we can measure the thickness of the material. Uh, we can look for cracks and faults and welds. 
Uh, that's the pulse echo form of ultrasound. Uh, power ultrasound would be like an ultrasonic parts cleaner to where they take a part, they submerse it in a solution, and then they uh, crank up and turn on high frequency sound waves. Well, those high frequency sound waves are what cleans the part. It knocks the dirt and debris off the part. Uh, but the form of ultrasound that we deal with uh, at UE Systems is airborne and structure borne. So we're either listening through the air for some sort of high frequency sound or structure borne now to where we make contact with that piece of equipment and we can hear what's taking place inside of that, uh, that equipment. So whether that be a bearing, a pump, a motor, a steam trap, a valve, uh, anywhere where we would make contact and we would be listening for uh, internal or high frequency sound. So uh, if you remember from the P to F curve, uh, most uh, P F curves that you see, uh, that first P1 or the technology that's going to find that fault or failure at its earliest instance is ultrasound. Uh, you know, again, we're finding early stage bearing failure, premature bearing failures, uh, it's very easy to do with ultrasound, again, because we're just listening for slight changes in the decibel level. Uh, really, one of the advancements in ultrasound over the last few years has been through uh, basically recording the ultrasound, so uh, being able to record the sound of what we're hearing, and it really paints a picture of exactly what we're hearing. So we can then see that in either the FFT or the time waveform. Uh, here, the, the picture here on the left is a screenshot from our UltraProbe 15000 that shows a, uh, an inner race bearing defect on a, a motor. Uh, when you're in that FFT screen, it'll actually uh, detect the peak for you. So what you can do then is go over, if you need to do some further analysis in the UE Spectralizer software, uh, just simply play that sound back. And uh, we actually have a bearing fault frequency calculator integrated into that software to where if you know just two basic pieces of information, such as the speed and then the number of balls or the number of bearings, it'll calculate out an outer race, inner race, ball pass, and a cage frequency. Or if you know a specific fault harmonic that you're looking for, there's a, uh, an option on there in the FFT screen that, uh, where you can enter in that, uh, that, that value or that number in either hertz or cycles per minute. And then when you turn that on, you will then have a series of cursors that appear on the screen. And if they line up with that peak, then it's pretty well safe to say uh, that's what the problem is. So uh, isolates the signal. What we mean there is just simply the, the nature of high frequency sound is that it doesn't travel out very far from the source. So it's, it's low, low energy, so it doesn't travel very far from the source. So it makes it very easy to identify problems because, again, the, the instrument is only listening for the high frequency, uh, so it's very directional. Uh, the quality of the bearing can be heard. Uh, if you have a bearing that is just in a need of lubrication, uh, it's just a uniform increase in friction compared to, uh, in this example, uh, if you have an inner race defect or some sort of uh, other defect, so again, it's kind of the next stage of bearing failure. Uh, the quality of that sound or the quality uh, of the bearing sound is going to be a lot different. So you begin to hear more of the impacts. You begin to hear more of the grinding, kind of uh, popping and crackling sounds that obviously would indicate some sort of problem. Uh, again, it's going to de uh, detect a lack of lubrication. And again, uh, it's going to find defects not heard in just standard time-based lube routes to where we go out with just a grease gun, again, because we're not listening to the bearing. So using ultrasound, we can prevent over-lubrication. Uh, a big application as well is going to be uh, for use on slow-speed bearings. Uh, we have people who are using ultrasound on uh, applications as low as 2 and 3 RPM. Uh, when you're in those extreme slow-speed uh, applications, if the bearing is good, you're, you're probably not going to hear much of anything. Uh, it may not even register a decibel level. Uh, but what happens is every time on that rotation, if, if a fault starts to occur, then every time on that rotation, it might just be as subtle as a click or a pop. And it shows up very nicely in the time waveform when you record that sound, or if you're looking at it on the screen of the UltraPro 15000 while you're, you're listening uh, to that point. But you know, either way, a, uh, a multi-technology approach uh, is the correct approach for your program. 
uh, you know, if you rely, you know, solely on vibration or if you're relying only on uh, thermography or infrared, then you're going to run the risk of uh, not finding those faults and failures at their earliest instant. And so you've got to make sure that you use technology for the right failure mode, basically. Uh, being able to, uh, to use a multi multitude of technologies to be able to find uh, the different failure modes, that's really where you want to be in your maintenance and reliability program. So getting into now the procedure, um, we're going to talk about using a digital instrument now to collect data. Uh, we can set up routes in the software. Um, really your, your only limitation for either uh, any of our instruments that have data storage capability, uh, your only limitation is 400 points per route. Uh, you can have an indefinite number of routes that you can create, uh, but your only limitation is the 400 points. Uh, which I really wouldn't recommend setting up a route of 400 points. It would uh, obviously take a little more time to go out and collect that data. Uh, it'd be a little hard to manage that much data, especially if you have, you know, if you're storing decibel level as well as sound file recordings. So maybe you would want to break that up into either maybe uh, two smaller routes of 200 points or even four routes of 100 points. Uh, but again, your, your, your limitation there is 400 points. And then we're going to take that data and we're going to download it into the software. And that's where we uh, really, the last couple of years, we have been able to create some very nice reports. Uh, I'll have some screenshots of those reports that you can generate. Um, we'll talk about those as we go through this. So first of all, obviously you'd want to maybe prioritize your equipment based off of some sort of asset criticality assessment uh, or list. Uh, you know, what's the likelihood of a failure? Uh, you know, what's the, the runtime, you know, the cost to repair, uh, the consequences of a failure, uh, do I have a part, you know, in, in my spares, uh, what's the lead time for, for getting a replacement, uh, a replacement part, uh, and then set up the routes to collect the ultrasound data, including the recording of the sound files. Again, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, setting baselines, and uh, ideally when you're setting up these uh, or collecting the initial uh, round of data and collecting that initial baseline data, ideally you'd want to have the decibel level as well as the sound file. Uh, once that initial readings have been taken, uh, then you're going to set your baseline. And uh, that's easily done in the DMS software. Uh, if you take a reading and you download it into your route, the very first reading, the UltraTrend DMS software defaults to the first reading you take and download into it, it sets it as the baseline. Uh, but you can change that baseline at any time. You just simply would highlight that the, whatever reading you wanted to set. And then over on the right-hand side of the record information tab in DMS, you have a baseline option or a baseline button, and you would just check that. And then you, once you do that, you change that baseline. So once your baseline has been established, you can set those alarm levels. Uh, so in, in the DMS software, you have an alarms tab. So based off of your baseline, you can set two different alarms. You can set a low-level alarm and then a high-level alarm. Uh, the low-level alarm is going to be our lack of lubrication point. So it's the point where the decibel level has increased just enough, uh, again, to let us know that you know, it needs to be lubricated. Uh, but it hasn't increased enough to throw it into the high-level alarm, which, again, would indicate that kind of next stage of bearing failure. Uh, and that would be to the point where, you know, maybe depending on how critical the asset is, you know, maybe you want to come out with vibration analysis to do a second opinion test, just to do a follow-up test. Uh, maybe you want to come out with ultrasound and re-record the sound file and compare it to the baseline sound file. Uh, either way, you're going to need to take some sort of action, uh, further action. You know, it's beyond the lack of lubrication at that point. So once we have the baseline and the alarm set, uh, then from there on out, it's only about storing just the decibel level. Really the only time that we really need to record a sound file again is when it reaches an alarm level. Uh, you know, if you're trending that decibel level and it's not an alarm, uh, then you know you're okay. Uh, but again, once it goes into either the low or the definitely the high alarm, you'd want to re-record the sound file. And then uh, one of the features that I really like in Spectralizer is the overlay feature. Uh, so you can have up to four FFTs on the screen at the same time. So it's a great way to compare, say, your baseline reading to your alarm level reading, or it's a great way to compare uh, four identical points on four identical machines. So then uh, if, 
we do have a, uh, a point that's in that, that alarm level condition, then that's where we can take our grease caddy out. We can apply grease until it drops back down to the baseline, and then we know that we've applied the proper amount of grease. So here are some screenshots from uh, some of the reports from what I've talked about so far. Uh, starting over here on the, on the, uh, the right-hand corner, uh, here is an, an image from Spectralizer where we're showing an overlay, so we're comparing four identical points, uh, four identical machines. Uh, this was a, a motor outboard points on the motor one outboard, motor two outboard, motor three outboard, and then this is the motor four outboard point here. So again, obviously much different from the other three. Uh, and again, we can easily identify that we have some sort of bearing harmonic there. Uh, starting here in the middle now, uh, we have what we call the four image report. So it really is a nice uh, point specific report where we can incorporate uh, the trend. So uh, we can see we have an image here from our ultra trend DMS of a plot at the decibel level. Uh, we're comparing that against a baseline, a low alarm and a high alarm. Uh, we had gone out and taken an infrared camera image, so again, uh, so again, we can uh, take our infrared camera out if we want to tie that into our bearing route or you know really any route. Uh, we can take an infrared image, and then as long as it's a JPEG format, you can dump that into your DMS. Uh, the UltraProbe 15000 also has a digital camera, so you can see that image there, and then we can also. Uh, take this uh, image from Spectralizer, save that as an image, and then attach it back into our route into DMS. So the four image report uh, will give us our data, up to four images, any comments, and then as well as a sound file. So we can attach a sound file in there as well. Uh, the report here is the what's called the, uh, the lube route report. So again, we can go out with our ultrasound instrument, collect the data, download it into the software, and then we're really only concerned about the points that are in alarm. So we can come back here and generate a lube route report. Uh, there's another one in there called the alarm report. So again, that's going to generate us a report showing uh, everything that's currently in the low and high alarm. Uh, with the lube route report, we've got two extra columns here that says type of lube and then lube. So we can enter in the type of grease there and then whether we lubricated it or not. And then this here, uh, there on the left, bottom left, is just a, a blown up uh, image of the chart there. So again, we're trending that decibel level over time. Uh, we have a, a tab in there called History Info. So uh, again, if you're using, say, the UltraProbe 15000, which also has an integrated spot radiometer, uh, so we're taking decibel level and temperature readings, you could also plot temperature on the same chart. So we could see how changes in temperature correlate to changes in the decibel level. So after we review the data, uh, we're going to select the bearings that are in need of further action. Uh, again, depending on how critical the asset is or if it's into the high alarm stage, uh, we obviously need to take some sort of action to either repair, uh, change it out. Uh, maybe you do want to take, uh, take your grease gun out and, and grease it. Uh, now you could probably apply some grease and the decibel level may come back down some. Uh, if you have a point that's in the high alarm, but it's probably never going to come back down to the point uh, where it should be either the baseline or even back out of uh, the low alarm stage or the high alarm stage. Uh, do we want to do a follow-up inspection with another technology? And then report your findings. Uh, one of the great things that I love to see when I go into plants and facilities, uh, I love to see maintenance and reliability really showcasing what they're doing. Um, not only does that create to help uh, buy-in you know, from people in production and operations, um, so in our case, uh, you have people out working in production, you know, out there with the machine, and you see somebody walking around with, uh, you know, with this ultrasonic instrument. They've got a headset on, and you know, they think, "What are you doing?" So, you know, reporting your findings, showcasing, you know, what you're finding with, you know, any of your technologies and what you're doing with maintenance and reliability really helps to create buy-in. Um, so uh, that's always something I really like to see. And that could be just as simple as being in the, you know, in your cafeteria, your break room. Maybe you have some kind of a, a board up by the time clock. But, uh, you know, really just kind of showcase what you're, what you're doing when it comes to maintenance and reliability. So again, our procedure, if the bearing needs grease, uh, that decibel level is going to drop as grease is applied. 
if you're listening and, and watching with uh, watching the decibel level, if the bearing is already over lubricated, then as soon as we start to apply grease, uh, typically it's going to start to just gradually increase. So if we see that, then we know to stop. And then if there's no change in the decibel level after we've applied grease, then some sort of further action should be taken to see why there was no change. Uh, maybe the bearing is in a failure mode that lubrication is not the solution to. Uh, and that would only be found out by you know, either recording the sound file and then looking at it in FFT or time waveform and spectralizer or uh, through your vibration analysis if you want to come out with a, a complementary technology. So let's say you did have a, a point uh, or a, a, a point along the route that was into the low level alarm or into the high level alarm. Uh, maybe you want to decide to just come out and do a follow up inspection. So after we've greased it, uh, maybe just a few days later, come out and take a second reading just to make sure that it, the decibel level did not creep back up into the alarm level. Uh, I, as I mentioned, if you have a uh, bearing defect, especially if it's an early stage bearing defect, you can apply grease to it, but it's only going to hide it for a short amount of time. And before you know it, that decibel level is going to you know, have crept back up to uh, where it was into the alarm stage. So again, maybe for more critical assets, you do some sort of follow-up test uh, after you've uh, lubricated it, just to make sure that the decibel level did not come back up. Uh, we see a lot of people adjusting PMs. So uh, again, going back to the time-based procedure, if you're on a time-based PM regarding lubrication, uh, you know, I always use the example, you know, a PM is generated that says go to a particular piece of equipment and apply 10 shots of grease. Well, uh, let's say the bearing didn't need grease. If we go out and put 10, sh uh, 10 shots of grease in it, you know, at that point we've over lubricated the bearing. Uh, but let's say the PM calls for 10 shots and we're using our grease caddy to listen and monitor that decibel level as we're applying grease. And let's say after four shots of grease, the decibel level has come back down to either the baseline or the normal level. Well, at that point, there's no need to put six more shots of grease into that bearing. Again, we're only going to over lubricate it. So we see people adjusting PMs based off of uh, the amount of grease, uh, what ultrasound tells them is enough. Uh, and then, you know, what ultrasound tells them as far as uh, lubrication. So going back to uh, our PM, so let's say that PM called for a month later to go out and grease that equipment. Well, uh, you know, we go out and we listen with ultrasound. Well, let's say after, you know, one or two strokes of grease, the decibel level starts to go up. Obviously, it didn't need to be greased a month later. So we can adjust the frequency or how often we're greasing that piece of equipment. So really there's uh, kind of what I would consider uh, three scenarios here when it comes to lubrication. I've just simply called it good, better, and best. Uh, so the good scenario would be to lubricate equipment according to the manufacturer's recommendations, uh, consult with, with your lubricant supplier to ensure that the correct lubricant is being used, and determine the frequency and type of lubricant based off of runtime and operating conditions. Uh, uh, so that's a good scenario. It's better than just going blind with a grease gun and just, you know, putting out many pumps of grease we feel is needed. Uh, the better scenario would be to continue on the time-based LU PM, but implement an ultrasonic instrument, uh, uh, the grease caddy, to listen to the bearings while we apply the lubricant. At least this is going to let the lubricator know when to stop applying grease. Again, uh, if the bearing needed grease, they're going to see a drop in the DB. If it was already over lubricated, as soon as they start to apply grease, we're going to see the DB increasing. Uh, and then if there's no change in the DB, then we know some sort of follow-up uh, inspection needs to be done. And again, you know, uh, other problems will be found. So your lubricator almost becomes your fault finder. Uh, again, they're going to compare, uh, be comparing decibel levels to identical equipment. Um, and then, you know, again, the sound quality of that bearing can be heard. Uh, so we're listening to the bearing, and that's important. And then the best scenario uh, that we've talked about is going to be to make use of an ultrasonic instrument that has you know, some sort of data collection capabilities to record both, both the decibel level and the sound files. Again, collecting that initial round of, of baseline data, we need to make sure that we include the, the decibel level and then the sound file. Again, the sound file, when we record that, that's what really paints the picture and what we're hearing. 
uh, we establish baselines and alarm levels, and our baseline, you know, how we establish that is through the historical method. So it forces us to create the route. It forces us to go out and begin to collect data and build a history on that equipment. And then we can choose whatever uh, reading that we want to make the baseline. And again, uh, you know, make sure uh, you know, good practice is when we're collecting that baseline data, maybe take a grease gun out with you. Uh, if you're listening to it and you apply grease, the decibel level drops, then that's probably the reading you want to take and use that as your baseline because obviously uh, that bearing needed to be greased. It was in a lack of lubrication condition. So, so then we lubricate the equipment with an ultrasound instrument once the data point is into that low alarm stage. So we're trending, uh, we're monitoring you know, what's currently in the low and high alarms, and then we're greasing only the points that are currently in the low alarm condition. So instead of going out and greasing everything like we normally would on a time-based lube route, then now we're only greasing when ultrasound has alerted us that it needs its time for grease. So we apply the lubricant until the decibel level decreases back to the baseline, and then we stop. And again, for more critical assets, we would want to do some sort of follow-up inspection to make sure that uh, lubrication was the solution and to make sure that the decibel level remained at the baseline level. And uh, a new sound file should then be recorded and compared to the original baseline sound file. So at this point, uh, we've got a couple of sound files that I'll play for you, and hopefully uh, this audio will come through okay. Uh, if any of you would like these sound files, uh, I'll be glad to email them to you. You can just let me know. Uh, my email address will be at the, on the very last slide once we get to the questions. So what we're going to hear is a bearing in the process of being lubricated. And first of all, just visually, you can see here's our before lubrication, and then here's our after lubrication. Uh, so this is going to be what it's going to sound like in your headset if you're using the Reed Scatty. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we, we couldn't hear that, Adrian. I think. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. So we might right. have to Let's... just email those out after. Sure. That's always the hard part with these webinars. Sure. Sometimes those sound files yeah. don't work great. Yeah, and if nothing else, uh, these two same sound files are all, also in our sound recording library on our website. So uh, if you just go to our website, it's just uesystems.com, uh, you'll see a link for the sound recording library. Uh, but as I mentioned, if if uh, you would like to have these for your use at your facility, I'll be glad to email the sound file as well as these associated screenshots. So here's what happens when we can see the, the whole thing, you know, what happens, you know, before lubrication, uh, which we see over here on the far left. Uh, and then we see the, really the point here where they should have stopped applying grease. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, they decided to keep going. And you can see just about on every stroke of grease thereafter, how, you know, what happens when we over-lubricate bearings. Again, we're increasing both pressure and friction inside the housing, which in turn creates more noise. Okay, so that kind of brings us to uh, the UltraProbe 401 Digital Grease Caddy, uh, much different from the UltraProbe 201 Grease Caddy that's been out for, uh, gosh, uh, 10 years now. Uh, so we're going to show you uh, just kind of some of the features here. Uh, you basically have two display panels. You have where you can see uh, DB only or DB with an intensity bar graph. Uh, so that would be similar to, say, our UltraProbe 9000 or 3000 instruments. Uh, you have some different uh, customizable settings and features here. Uh, some of those are just uh, kind of personal preference setups. Uh, some of them are, you know, you can set up different ways on how you want to store the data and what information you do want to store. Uh, one thing that's really different about this one compared to the UltraProbe 201 Grease Caddy is the fact that we do have frequency tuning. So um, the 201 digit, the UltraProbe 201 Grease Caddy was on a fixed frequency centered around 38 kilohertz. Uh, so the UltraProbe 401 Digital Grease Caddy is going to have frequency tuning starting at 20 kilohertz all the way to 100 kilohertz. So um, we can, uh, obviously, the, the frequency setting that we teach and uh, recommend when it comes to mechanical inspection is 30 kilohertz. So you can actually tune it to the same frequency setting as, say, your UltraPro 9000, 10,000, or 15,000. We can uh, upload routes from UltraTrend DMS and store that data and then download that information back into DMS. 
uh, again, 400 data point storage. Uh, one thing that we really like about it, and we can kind of see maybe where this is headed, is we can actually record the amount of grease that we added. So you can actually input in there how many strokes of grease uh, that you added. And if you've calibrated your grease gun, you're going to know based off of each stroke of grease how much grease is coming out of that grease nozzle. So you can uh, correlate that into however you measure, uh, measure that if you're calibrating your grease guns. Uh, one thing that I really like about it also is the fact that it connects to our remote access sensors. So we've seen a, uh, a huge increase in the number of people who want to monitor things remotely. And the, the one sensor that we have that connects directly to the Ultra Probe is what we call the, the RAS or the remote access sensor. So it's a stud mounted sensor that you can mount to a piece of equipment you know, while it's not running. So if you have something behind the cage or a guard that you just can't access, you can mount the sensor while the equipment is not running. Run your cable out to, uh, to the outside and you can plug directly into the Ultra Probe or uh, a new uh, product that we've started offering are junction boxes. So you can bring all of those RASs back together to a junction box and then you can plug in directly from the Ultra Probe into the junction box. So uh, obviously you would just need to have your grease fittings uh, extended out to where you can grease it you know, from outside the, the guard or the cage. Uh, but again, we can listen to it, watch the decibel levels, so we can make sure that the grease is getting uh, to where it needs to go and then to make sure that we're obviously applying uh, the, the correct amount of grease. Uh, the battery is just a lithium polymer uh, rechargeable. Uh, there's a built-in LED light for dark areas similar to the, the Ultra Pro 201 and it's going to come with your headset uh, and we can do that either wired or wirelessly. Now the uh, the Ultra Pro 401 digital grease caddy doesn't have Bluetooth built in into it, but uh, if you want to use a wireless headset, then you can get a wireless transmitter and then that's going to transmit wirelessly to the wireless headset. So that is an option as well. Uh, here's what the kit uh, you know, OSHA. Uh, here is your, your magnetic connection here, it's just a PNC to the front of the instrument. Uh, your recharger, uh, the docking plate. So if you don't have good access to uh, to connect up your magnetic mount contact probe there, uh, then you can just mount this on the end of the grease nozzle where the grease is coming out. So it makes a perfect little uh, uh, testing point for your magnetic contact probe uh, and you can pick up the sound that way. Uh, obviously if you want to attach it to a grease gun, you've got your little hose clamp, your swivel mounts there. Here is your, uh, your SD card slot is on the right hand side. Uh, you've got a simple just on and off uh, button there uh, as well as that is kind of a multi-function button. So not only does it power it on and off, we can also do different uh, functions there on the display. And then we also have our sensitivity and frequency adjustment dial here. Uh, there's our LED light. And then here is our BNC connection where we would either plug in the remote mount that comes standard with the grease caddy or if we're using those remote access sensors, we would just plug in the, the RAS sensor there. So again, just recapping some of the features, we can upload routes from DMS. Uh, you can also choose to just upload the points currently in alarm group. So if you have a bearing route, uh, set up in DMS, you'll notice there's kind of a little subgroup up at the top or the bottom depending on where you have it called points currently in alarm. So we can load just our alarm group into the grease caddy. So that's just, uh, again, that's just a route of the points that are currently in alarm. So we're trending the decibel level, the number of strokes of grease, uh, the actual strokes of grease, so not only the number of strokes that it may have called for, but the actual amount of strokes that we uh, that took to bring that decibel level you know down or you know it, uh, or increase you know obviously uh, if we start to over lubricate that's going to increase. Uh, we can also input when our grease gun is uh, is in need of calibration. So again, if you're calibrating your your grease guns, uh, you can have that in there uh, according to what grease gun you were using when you went to take that data. 
So some extra fields that we're going to have in uh, in the DMS software. Uh, you know, hopefully in a few weeks we're doing some final testing with uh, with some of these new fields. We can enter in the grease type and viscosity in the DMS, uh, and this just adds to the history information for that machine. So we can ensure that we're always using the correct grease type for that machine, and that's going to help us to monitor more closely uh, the associated costs with lubricant. So. Again, if we're calibrating the grease gun, uh, we're going to know how much grease that we injected, and we're going to know how much that grease is costing us. So we can then, you know, trend and report, you know, the cost per mass or the cost per per uh, injected cost rather. So, you know, really this advancement in ultrasonic condition monitoring is going to help us to identify previously unknown bearing conditions. Uh, it's going to reduce lubrication-related failures. You know, remember, the majority of bearing failures can be attributed to lubrication, and under and over lubrication being two of those. Um, so, if we can help to reduce that, then we've reduced a huge number of uh, failures, you know, attributed to lubrication. Uh, we can increase the effectiveness of our PMs. Again, we're adjusting those based off of what ultrasound tells us as far as the the amount of grease, and then the frequency, how often we're greasing. And then the ultimate goal of all of this, again, is to move more towards condition-based lubrication rather than time-based. So at this point, we've got a few minutes left for some questions. All right, great. Thanks, Adrian. And we did get uh, a few questions in here. Um, and I know you, you talked a little bit about it, but, but maybe you could just um, talk again about the, the best way for kind of taking those baseline readings and, and setting baselines? Yeah, so again, the, uh, the method that we, we call it, uh, in, if you've been to any of our training classes, uh, we call it the historical method. So we set our route up in the UltraTrend DMS software, and then we just begin to go out and collect data on those points. Now, when you're collecting that baseline data information, you know, you're probably going to want to take readings more frequently. Uh, again, we're just building a history. Um, and remember that in the DMS software, the very first reading that we take and download into it, that first reading, the software defaults and makes that one the baseline. But we can change that baseline at any time. So again, if we're collecting data and let's say we've got you know, four or five readings taken, uh, we can select any of those readings and make them the baseline. Again, uh, we want to make sure that we take a grease gun out with us. If we're applying grease, if that bearing needed grease, we're going to see that decibel level drop. That's probably the reading that you want to take and use that as your baseline because obviously that bearing needed to be greased. Uh, so that's a, that's a great tip uh, when you're collecting that initial baseline data. Uh, and again, we want to make sure, ideally, we'd like to collect both the decibel level and and the sound file recordings. So if you're using the UltraProbe 10,000 or the UltraProbe 15,000, uh, those are the two instruments that have the onboard sound recording. So once we've got our baseline set, we go over and we set our alarms. Uh, typically, uh, an 8 dB increase above the baseline is going to represent a lack of lubrication. Uh, the next stage, our high alarm is going to be, uh, most people are going to use 16 dB above the baseline, and that's going to represent that kind of next stage of bearing failure. Uh, where those numbers came from uh, initially came from a, a NASA study that was done back in the early to mid 80s, to where they looked at hundreds and hundreds of bearings and uh, you know using ultrasound, and that was kind of what they they found. And we've kind of reconfirmed that through uh, you know kind of doing our own research. Uh, we get a tremendous amount of feedback from our from customers, you know, people out in the field who are, are doing this on a daily basis, and they kind of reconfirm that for us. Uh, really, the only time that you'd want to look at changing the 8 and the 16 values would be on, you know, the extreme slow speed. As I mentioned, uh, if you're on that, you know, probably anything below 100 RPM, uh, you're going to get different readings. So you may want to cut those in half. That's typically what I see people do in the field. Uh, you know, they'll say maybe they use 4 dB as the low alarm or the lack of lubrication point, and then you know, maybe they use 8 for their high alarm stage. Uh, but in most cases, probably 95% of the time, it's going to be 8 and 16. That's what uh, people will use for those alarm levels. 
And then, you know, once we've set that baseline, we've set our alarms, from there on out, uh, we're just simply recording the decibel level. Uh, the only time that we need to record a sound file again is when we've reached an alarm level. So ho hopefully that answered that. Okay, great, thanks. Um, another person, actually a couple people were asking about this, and I know you talked a little bit about remote monitoring, but what about, um, you know, bearings that you just simply don't have access to? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of options. Uh, for the RAS sensors, uh, the standard lift of cables that you can specify uh, are either 25 feet or 50 feet. Uh, now we've, you know, you know, made some that are you know, shorter and longer than that, but the standard length of cables are 25 feet and 50 feet. Um, we have, uh, some of you may be familiar with a, an option that we have uh, kind of been using. It's a wireless option. It's called the TS1X uh, that we can, it uses our UltraTrack 750 uh, sensor which uh, has a standard 4 to 20 milliamp output, but the TS1X, it requires a BNC connection. So we can make those uh, UltraTrack 750s into a BNC connection that you would just plug into the, the TS1X node, and then it's going to transmit the data wirelessly. Now, it uses a separate software package, um, but again, you know, it's, it uses ultrasound. So uh, where we've had success with, success with it so far is uh, on a robot application. Uh, to where you know it really didn't make sense to do vibration analysis on the robot, so uh, they actually programmed the robot to go into a maintenance mode where it would cycle or turn uh, a full 360 degrees, and that's when they collect the data. So uh, you know they've had some success in finding uh, you know premature bearing failures on the the robot joints themselves. Uh, so that would be an option. Uh, we can send you additional information about that uh, if you like. Again, you've got my email address here. And I'll be glad to send you some specifics on that option as well. Cool. And um, a couple people have been asking just sort of for statistics, which I don't think we necessarily have, but maybe you can just give some feedback that you've heard from different customers about um, improvements they've seen when they've utilized the, the 201 Grease Caddy, and then, of course, what we can hope people to expect to see um, with the 401. Yep, uh, there was a, a great presentation done uh, about a year ago, um, well, probably a couple of years ago now, by uh, Kim Hunt with Domtar Paper, and that is also archived on our website, so if you just Google that or go to our website and, and enter that in the search. Uh, but again, it's Kim Hunt with Domtar Paper, who has implemented ultrasound-assisted lubrication now for, I think, going on three or four years at least. and uh, and. They have documented savings there in excess of a couple hundred thousand dollars. And again, most of that has come in through the motor rebuild cost, which was pretty much cut in half. So they were having a tremendous amount of over-lubrication over related failures. Uh, so they were able to reduce the amount of uh, motors that were needing to be sent out to be repaired and rebuilt uh, because they weren't over-lubricating equipment anymore. Uh, uh, she has, you know, some numbers associated with, um, you know, how much they saved in lubrication, so how much lubricant they were keeping on hand. Uh, that was greatly reduced. And then, again, the, the man time or the man hours out lubricating equipment. So, you know, they essentially made their PMs more effective. So instead of going out and greasing things that didn't need to be greased, you know, they were able to take that time to do more productive things with their time. So. Uh, but again, that's archived on the website, and uh, that would be a great resource for anyone who is considering implementing ultrasound for lubrication. Yeah, and that uh, just to kind of bring up an, an idea here, when when this is over and we get this recording up on the website, we'll send out an email to all of you that participated today, um, and we can it simply include um, links actually to Kim's webinar that she did because you're right, that's a great. Um, case study for folks um, that are interested, and we can also put in um, links to you know additional presentations and webinars we've done specifically on ultrasound-assisted lubrication, just to kind of help you know really give you guys the the full picture of, of what we've got uh, going here. So hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, a couple people have asked about um, you know, safety ratings on, on the new um, 401, um, utilizing it in, in hazardous areas. 
So maybe you can just touch on on that, and then you know the other older folks that we've got that that where that would be, you would be able to use them. Yep, sure. Um, yeah, the Ultra Probe 401 digital grease caddy is not uh, intrinsically safe or ATEX rated. Um, you know, with it just being released, uh, you know, it's a very long process to have something rated. It goes through a rather rigorous uh, test, uh, and that takes a long time. So, uh, whether we'll be able to submit that for uh, rating, I'm not sure. Uh, but at this point, the only instruments that we have that are intrinsically safe are going to be the, the Ultra Probe 2000, which has been around for years. Uh, it's a Class One, Division One group, A, B, C, and D. Uh, but several years ago, we actually released an intrinsically safe version of the Ultra Probe 9000, which is a Class One, Division One group, C, and D, and it also has ATEX rating as well. Um, you know, you know, people, you know, people use the, you know, the let's say the, the 10, the 15, or even the standard grease caddy in those areas. Uh, typically, uh, we don't see many people having issues with getting, say, hot work permits or, you know, wearing some sort of uh, a monitoring device, uh, you know, uh, that will, you know, sense, you know, hazardous gases or whatever. Uh, but currently, the only two instruments that we have that have any kind of intrinsically safe rating are going to be the 2000 and and the 9000. Now the, the 9000, uh, for those of you that are say using the 2000, because it has the intrinsically safe rating, uh, maybe you didn't know about the 9, but it is a class 1, division 1 group uh, C and D, and uh, as well as ATEX. Alright, great. Well we've got um, probably some other questions that uh, we're just, you know, we're running out of time here, so what we'll do is we will be sure if, if we didn't get your question answered, um, we will get in touch with you after the webinar is over so we can get that, um, get you guys all the answers you need. Um, and of course, you know, as I said, we'll send out this, this email with, with some additional resources for you um, so that, uh, you know, you guys can have all the information you need. Um, you know, Adrian mentioned at the beginning, you know, kind of talking about the complementary technologies that are out there, infrared vibration. Um, and, and really knowing when to use those and what failure modes to use them for. And um, it was kind of actually a great lead-in because our next webinar, which is going to be on uh, December 18th, I believe, yep, 18th, um, is going to be Terry Harris, and he's actually going to be doing a webinar on basically what technology to use when. Um, so if that's of interest, I, I saw some questions did come through that were kind of asking, well, when, you know, infrared versus ultrasound. And, um, so I think that'll be a really helpful webinar for, for, for you guys. So you'll see the invite for that coming out soon. And um, also just to kind of plug our conferences that we've got coming up next June, Ultrasound World and Reliable Asset World. Um, one of the pre-conference workshops is actually going to be on um, as, uh, equipment uh, criticality. So um, again, something that Adrian mentioned, you know, knowing which are your most critical assets and things like that. So that's going to be a great opportunity to really um, do some hands-on work on, on how to, to rate your equipment. So um, with that, I think we'll let you all go and enjoy the rest of your day. Adrian, thanks so much for uh, walking us through this today. And uh, you all will be hearing from us uh, here shortly with uh, the follow-up information that we promised. And uh, as always, if you have any additional questions, um, you've got our contact information. You can see Adrian's up there now. and. Uh, and you, you'll have my email, obviously, as we send out the information. So be in touch with us, and uh, we hope everybody has a great day, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.